Howdy, my name is Jordan Fisher, and today I will be talking about the ecological and agricultural impacts of wild hog populations. But before I get into the meat of the presentation, let me go over a quick outline, just explaining the information that we'll be covering during this presentation. So first I want to introduce the animal, Sus scrofa, or that is the scientific name for the wild hog. And I want to talk about how this wild hog was introduced to North America and introduced to our civilization, first and foremost. Next, I'd like to talk about the mass proliferation after the uh, species had established itself in its new environment. And then I'd like to talk about the agricultural and ecological impacts that these pigs are having on the environment. And then finally, I'd like to talk about some of the population management control techniques that we've been implementing and experimenting with to see how we can help mitigate the issues that are associated with these large pig populations. So as promised, let's talk about how they were introduced to us. So it's important to remember that these wild hogs are actually a non-native species to us, meaning that they did not live here originally. They were actually introduced by early settlers to the Americas and they were brought as domesticated animals used for food generally. But some of the individuals escaped and some were let free um, in hopes that they could provide some kind of hunting herd for the settlers. Um, and since those select individuals got out, they have gone across the United States and they now inhabit um, almost all 50 of the states. So the, the states that are most um, constant, that the hogs are most concentrated in are going to be the southern states. States like Texas, Louisiana, uh, Oklahoma, even Georgia and Florida. And so that leads me to this graphic here of Texas. And as you can clearly see, the majority of the state is a very, very dark shade of green, which means they are heavily populated by these pigs. Even in the, the areas that seem to be white, they're actually flaked with green dots, indicating that there are um, active and live hog populations in the area. So moving on, let's, let's look at some population growth data and kind of talk about why this is important. And the first thing that, or the first reason, the why reason it's most important is because a growing population of feral hogs is gonna lead to an increased um, increase severity of destruction and damage to the ecosystem and to the agriculture system for us. So looking at this chart here, this is going to sh show the survival rate and population growth of wild hogs. It's specifically looking at three age group of hog and three conditions, poor, intermediate, and optimal conditions in which pigs live. So the, the age classes are easy. It's just juveniles, yearlings, and adults. So very young, middle-aged pigs, and older pigs. And like I said before, the conditions are poor, intermediate, and good conditions for these hogs. So if we look at the poor conditions here, the population growth rate is around 1% in the poorest of conditions that were studied. And that's very significant because where 1% seems like a very low number, the human population growth is actually 1.1%. And if you think about how fast we're growing and the issues that we will be encountering soon with our own population, you can see where this becomes an issue very quickly. So moving on down to the optimal conditions then, it's kind of scary because in the optimal conditions, the pig's growth percentage rate is 2%. That's almost double what it is for the human population growth rate. So if these numbers keep continuing, I mean, the population growth rate is going to get steeper. And like I said at the beginning of this PowerPoint here, um, the greater the population of wild hogs, the more damage that we are going to see. So let's actually get into some of the agricultural and ecological damage that these animals are causing for us. It's important to remember that these animals do live in large groups. They spend most of their waking hours um, foraging for food, doing a process called rooting. Rooting is basically 
where the pigs just use their snout and they overturn the first, like the top layer of soil in search of, of seeds and insects and food items. Which doesn't sound very bad, but it actually does cause quite a bit of damage and destruction of habitat for plants and animals in the area. This process also, as you can see in the picture, can lead to be very destructive over a large area of land. This entire field here was rooted by um, probably just a single little colony of pigs. So agricultural losses have been estimated in the billions. I've heard upwards of 2.5 billions in my readings. And you, this isn't just a money thing, they're also contaminating water sources for us and for the animals that live in this uh, ecosystems. So moving on to their diet now. Their diet, pigs are omnivorous, which means that they eat both meat and vegetables. They can sustain from both. But I wanna skip the vegetable portion for now and just kinda talk about the meats that they're eating. Cause those tend to be a little bit more destructive. So during stomach evaluations, scientists have found that they're actually eating small vertebrates. They're eating commonly things like mice and even birds and bird eggs too. So if we, and you know, they've even seen white tailed deer fawns in some of these stomach evaluations that they've done, which was very surprising to me. You know, it's a very large animal for a pig to be consuming and whether that animal was dead and the pig was scavenging and he just, consume the, the deer, or if he actually hunted and killed it, is up for debate. Um, but nonetheless, the point is getting across that they will eat anything that's in their path. So other than just the direct destruction of these animals, you know, they are, they are out competing animals like the deer and the turkey for the resources and the food that they survive on. They're destroying their habitat through rooting, and some of these animals are having a hard time um, adjusting and accommodating for this giant growth and population of ours. And if we look down here, we're actually starting to see decimations of ground-dwelling animal populations. Specifically in one that's that's been very concerning, um, it are some of the quail species are being threatened by these hogs. Hogs are going through and they're rooting up and they're eating small quails and eating quail eggs and destroying their nests. And so over time, this, is, this has been detrimental to the quail population. But moving away from the quail and moving back to the deer, I want to I want to uh, address this graph here, and it's basically just showing the deer and the hog population rate of growth. And as we can see here in 1980, the deer population rate of growth was very high, especially in comparison uh, to the hogs' population of growth, which you can see here in the black. But as we move on down closer to 2000, we can see that gradually the deer population growth, growth rate has declined and the hog population growth rate has increased. Now scientists have linked this decline in deer population growth rate directly to uh, the, the hog growing population of hogs. So knowing that we have this issue and it's causing issues for humans and for the ecosystem alike, we, we have to look at some ways to mitigate this issue. So let's look at some popular control techniques that have been investigated and will continue to be investigated. So, so far a whole slew of population control management techniques have been looked at as far as hunting, several different kinds of hunting, aerial hunting, um, night hunting, hunting with dogs and knives, even things like trapping and snaring. But you know, for a large, for the large part of this, um, the, these techniques have proved to be very ineffective. Um, they're very time consuming, they're very expensive, and they've just yielded little success. Not to mention that all the, the control methods that I just mentioned are um, lethal versions, you know, and they were, we're really trying to go approach this in an ethical manner. So talking about the, the ethics behind it, we did try relocating and, and that was studied pretty intensively and that also just showed no, no, no effectiveness in decreasing the population size. We were just uh, essentially moving the problem somewhere else. So that brings me to the last uh, bullet point that I skipped over here and that's poison bait. I know that is considered a uh, lethal form of population control, but that has seemed to be the most effective at this time and the most humane. 
So let's move in and let's talk a little bit more about the warfarin poison bait. And I know poison bait sounds really sharp coming off the tongue, but let me explain this and hopefully that will uh, lighten the, the blow here. So warfarin is a first generation anticoagulant. And where that sounds very fancy, it's actually a very common product. And you may have heard of this. Um, it's actually used in, in rodent bait or rat poison. It's very common, so it's, it's a household item. It's been being used for rat bait for a very long time, but in hogs, they started using it around 2008. And it, in 2017, just gained its uh, product registration from the EPA, or Environmental Protection Agency, which is a big deal when we're looking at a lethal form of population control management. One of the reasons for this is this chemical has a very short half-life, meaning that it degrades very quickly in the body or out of the body. So that's a very good thing also when looking at um, uh, potential lethal controls of this nature. So the warfarin administration has been done orally, and that's what's been studied here, was the oral administration. And it's a feral hog specific bait, meaning that it attracts feral hogs and it, it, it is not targeted for uh, other animals that are in its ecosystem. So it's pretty easy to make a bait that attracts hogs because they eat, like I said earlier, just about everything. Um, so that really hasn't been an issue. And with concentrations as low as 0.005%, we are seeing a 100% mortality rate. So this is the minimally effective dose for this drug and it has been shown to be 100% effective at that dose, which is very rare and, and, and very effective. And moving on, this poses very minimal threats to non-target species. As I said, this was directed specifically for these pigs. So the, the chance of secondary exposure are very low and the chance of an animal coming in for this bait that is not a hog are also extremely low. Oh, and before I move on, I would like to touch on this graph. I know I said that warfarin had the 100% mortality rate, but that uh, this graph just depicts that. So this black line here shows all of the animals that consumed the warfarin bait. There's supposed to be a white line next to it, or not supposed to be, I guess, showing the animals that survived after consuming the bait. But as you can see here, none of the animals survived that consumed the oral concentration of 0.005% warfarin. And in the control group, on the contrary, all of the animals survived because obviously none of them took the bait. So moving on, we know we have a large issue here. I mean, we've discussed the agricultural losses, estimated up to $2.5 billion in damage annually. We've talked about the environmental uh, impacts that these hogs are having and how they're out competing some animals for resources. One thing that we didn't go over is that these, the, just because it wasn't the focus of my presentation, but these animals are also spreading disease out there. They're spreading disease to other animals and they're also spreading zoonotic diseases to human beings. So these, these are, this is also something to consider when looking at wild hog populations. So we know we have a growing uh, population and with growing population, we're gonna have growing disruptions and disturbances. Most population control methods have failed or uh, have proved to be minimally effective. And the, the ones that have proven to be effective have happened to be lethal, unfortunately. So this poses some ethical and moral issues. You know, how can we go about addressing this population control issue um, in the correct manner and being conscientious to people and, and animals alike. And that being said, you know, with warfarin as my top choice because it is low cost, it has low impact to non-target species, and it's got a very high efficacy rate. With the 100% mortality rate at 0 .005, I, I think that this is a very viable option for um, future control management techniques, and I think that it should be studied more. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.